Hi everyone, I'm Danette Kaplun, editor and founder of Hispana Global, coming to you live from the Baptist Health Newsroom. January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and many women, although this disease is highly preventable, still don't know that they are at a high risk of developing it. That's why we invited two very special guests today, because they're gonna help us raise awareness, learn more about how to prevent cervical cancer, and also understand a little bit about the myths and the realities. We have here Dr. Noah Kalman. Thank you so much for being with us here uh, today, radiation to oncologist. That. And we have Stephanie Goila, who is a survivor. And you've already shared your story with many people, but we are delighted to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. This is such an important topic because even though 13,000 women will be diagnosed this year alone in the US, many still don't know what the risk factors are. Could we discuss that a little bit, doctor? Yeah, sure. So, so cervical cancer is caused primarily by a virus called HPV or the human papillomavirus. And it's important to know because it's actually a preventable cancer. And so there are both screening tests for it, just for, for women in, in adulthood. And, but in addition, there's also a vaccine. And so we can talk about all of that. We, we have lots to talk about that. But also, I also want to address the symptoms because, Stephanie, you're very young. And many women are diagnosed in their 30s, but a lot of people don't know about this. So what were your symptoms at first? I actually had no symptoms. Um, I actually had abdominal pain from a cyst, which is, has nothing related to what um, was uncovered. Um, the emergency room doctor told me to go see a gynecologist, which I did, and an easy pap test um, came out positive for cervical cancer. And what happened next? I was um, referred to the best doctors in Miami. Um, I'm a freak for Googling, so as soon as she told me the name, um, I Googled to see what I was getting myself into, other than my diagnosis, who I was gonna, who was gonna treat me, and what the process would have been. Um, from then, I was in good hands. Thank goodness for that. Yes. And for everybody watching us on this Facebook Live, I want to remind you that you can send in your questions. Leave them in the comments below because we will be addressing all these, all the questions that you might have in this segment with Dr. Kelman and with Stephanie Goyla. So if you have any questions for them, please, please put them in the comments below. Doctor, you were discussing that this is a preventable disease. And in many cases, people aren't even aware that there's a vaccine that can be administered even as early as nine years of age. And there's also many myths surrounding the vaccine. So why don't we talk a little bit about the HPV vaccine? Who should get it? So essentially the HPV vaccine is recommended for girls and boys um, from the age of nine upwards. As you said, most people get it at age 11. That's the most common age when, it, when it's done. And it's a series of two uh, vaccine administrations that's done about six months apart and it's very effective at, at preventing the, the disease. There are over 200 types uh, of HPV, and so these vaccines really focus on the main types that can either cause cancers, um, so, and as well as uh, warts. And so it's very effective against both. And why are some parents maybe not so willing to give this vaccine to kids? So I think there's, there's a lot of always, um, I think there's a lot of myths that, that are out there about potential harm from, from vaccines. And I think you can say that about any medical treatment whatsoever. There, there's always a very small potential risk, but we know that there have been over 120 million vaccine injections given since, the, since it was introduced. And it has an excellent safety profile and the, and the benefits of getting the vaccine far, far outweigh any potential risk associated with it. So the scientific evidence dispels those myths. Exactly, exactly. And it's also important to know some people uh, focus, think that this is just a virus that causes cervical cancer. And it's important to know also that HPV causes other types of cancers as well, uh, including head and neck cancers. And so it's really a cancer prevention vaccine. And so it's wonderful that we, that we have it. I'm a big proponent of it. 
Me too, actually. I, I've read quite a lot, and even my kids have been vaccinated. So, but we know this already, like scientifically, and we know that the ages that you have already told us, the most common age is around 11. But what happens with adults, maybe in their 20s, or can you get your vaccine even in your 30s? Right, and so it used to be the guidelines recommended the vaccine for, again, men and women, boys and girls, up to the age of 26. And very recently, they've updated, the CDC has updated their guidelines to recommend the vaccine for patients up to age 45. And so, whereas for up to age 26, it's recommended for really everyone, um, for patients between in that age and their mid to late 20s up to 45, it's recommended for, for patients who may have additional uh, intimate partners because that, that's how the HPV vaccine is, is spread. And perhaps that's why it's so hard to talk about HPV and maybe that's why for parents sometimes it's, it's hard to address all these topics that can be a little uncomfortable to address with our kids. Exactly, and, and HPV is really, has always been thought of as a sexually transmitted disease or infection, but, but in reality it's, it's spread through other kinds of intimate contact as well, and if you look at the general population in the United States, you know, over 80% of people by the time they reach their 40s have been exposed to one strain of HPV. And but not everybody will develop cervical cancer, correct? Not all very, women exposed to very it? Very few, only a very small percentage will go on to develop a cancer. Um, but the important, and so we're still looking to figure out why some patients develop the, uh, a cancer either of the cervix or other sites and, and why most people don't. But we do know that the vaccine is effective before you've been exposed to the, to the virus. And so, and so that's why it's recommended at such a young age. And what are the special risk factors that can maybe increase your odds of developing cervical cancer like what happened to Stephanie? So uh, there, there are a couple of you know, risk factors. Uh, you know, actually, one of the larger ones is smoking, uh, interestingly enough. Um, can be multiple sexual partners. Uh, but it's, it's just because you either have some of those risk, risk factors or don't have those risk factors, it, it doesn't mean you're going to get or not get a cancer from HPV. Because again, su such a broad uh, component of the population will be exposed at some point. But being Hispanic American, African American, are those also considered risk factors? They are considered risk factors. Historically, uh, it's really cervical cancer, in addition to there being the vaccine, that it's also a disease that can be uh, found through routine screening, like the pap test that Stephanie was talking about. And now there's also co-testing that's done, both the standard PAP test as well as testing for high-risk strains of HPV during the same exam. So it's not an additional test, it's okay. just additional sampling that's done. And so, that is, so it's important for patients to actually get screened because even if they haven't had the vaccine, that for the majority of patients, if they're getting routine screening, that, the, that these tumors can be found at either a pre-cancer stage or at a very early stage and be, and be treatable. And Stephanie, in your case, was it caught very early on, or how complicated was the treatment for you? Um, it started off with we will remove it through an operation. Um, that is standard protocol. Then I did an MRI, and then the doctor's assistant called me and told me that my situation went in front of the tumor board at MCI, and a room which is the Miami Cancer Institute. Correct. I'm sorry. Um, nope. So for the the tumor board then decided along with a lot of specialists what the best treatment for me was going to be, and it was a session of radiation and chemotherapy um, for seven weeks long. And how did you tolerate that? Um, like a champ. <laughs> Um, because if you don't, it'll Absolutely wear you down. <laughs> you, it'll wear you down big time. Um, it was actually every single day from Monday through Friday after work because I was working. Because um, I wanted to because I think my employer would have been perfectly fine with me having the time off to take care of myself. Um, 
but I took upon myself to go to work. Um, my appointments were mostly at five o'clock. So 10 minutes of radiation and happy times with the team at Miami Cancer Institute. And then every Friday, I had chemo. So for every week session of radiation, external radiation, I had uh, one session of chemo. The chemo for me was, I had to get it through my veins. Normally, uh, what I was told is that people get a port um, and then there's where um, you would have to do a surgery to put that port in and everything happens through there. I did not have to go through that because the tumor board, um, along with um, the wonderful doctors there, specialists, um, said that it's going to be seven weeks, um, seven treatments of chemo. You should be fine taking it through your veins, which, which I took it like a champ. That was, that was tough. That was tough. And then um, other than external radiation, I also had something they call the brachytherapy. Um, it's high dosage radiation, which is um, they, I should let Dr. Kalman tell you. <laughs> this is not my piece. <laughs> no, but, but please, I mean, you became an expert. I mean, and, and I mean. This is very helpful for people who are viewing this yes. segment on Facebook because there's not that much information. Right, right. So and the good thing about Miami Cancer Institute is that they explain every single treatment along the way. Um, they make sure that you understand what you go through and what is being done. So um, the HDR, I, they had to add applica um, applicators inside of me and that would focus specifically on the on tumor the and, ki and kill it. I had five sessions of that, and I even have a picture of that. Like, I had to be on anesthesia, and I was in a picture right after. So that was my treatment, and it wore me down, but every single day with a positive mind, I got through it. And you're here. Yes. yes. And Dr. Coleman commends you because he <laughs> has also known your case. Tell me a little bit about how the tumor board process, because it seems a very personalized approach to each right, patient. Right, and so with the, at the tumor board process at Miami Cancer Institute, we have a group of physicians and other providers that meet to discuss each, patient, each patient's case uh, who's coming in for a consultation. And so in Stephanie's case, we had myself in radiation oncology that was there. There were gynecologic oncologists who were there. Uh, pathologists to look at the biopsy results, radiologists to help us go through imaging, and then there are other providers as well. So it's a big group that, that comes together to talk about every case and figure out the best treatment for, for an individual patient. For that person, so exactly. that way it's a not one size fits all. Right, and, and as Stephanie was saying, when she first uh, came, came to Miami Cancer Institute that the initial plan was, was for surgery because it uh, was hoped to be an, an early uh, stage case, but then with additional imaging and with review, it was that we decided that we, she needed a uh, different treatment than, than surgery. And that was that she was talking about a combination of radiation treatment and chemotherapy. And in general, what is the prognosis with patients who catch cervical cancer early on? So generally, it's, it's very good. And so we expect with our, for patients that, that present with, uh, you know, for example, in, in Stephanie's case, we came in, we said, we're gonna, you, you might not like us that much at the, at the end, but, but we're gonna get you through that the, this is what we do and, and we expect you to do great. And how are you doing? Great, <laughs> great, I'm doing great, no, nothing to complain, nothing to complain at all. And was there anything that surprised you along this process? Stephanie? Um, when they said that I was going to feel fatigue, I laughed. And fatigue is no joke. It's like taking a shower for five minutes and feeling like you ran a marathon for three hours. That is no joke. And, and you were still working. Um, by that time, I think that was my f sixth week that I s really started to feel fatigue. By that time, I already asked for time off. Um, actually, I worked from home that last week. And then the week after that, I took it completely off. So um, I got a chance to sit on my couch at work, fall asleep when I felt like it, because um, you can't do that. Um, I'm that type of person that get up and do whatever just to make myself feel better. But 
in that situation, you need to give your body time to relax because that's what it's asking for. Um, hey, you're beating me up. Let's just relax a little bit. And, and that way you can also heal a little bit better. Faster. Yeah. Yes, correct. And doctor, what do you think is very important for patients to keep in mind during the treatment if they're diagnosed? So I think for in terms of during treatment, yes. I think it, it's important to make sure that really you're very open with, with your treatment team. And so if there's an issue that comes up during treatment, we want to know about it, then we want to be able to deal with it. So in terms of the, you know, the fatigue, you know, that's, that's definitely one that comes up a lot. And as Stephanie was describing, people who take frequent breaks, and, and then as she was saying, just listen to your body, right? That that's an important one during treatment. Um, but there are other effects that we can cause, some irritation of the bowel, irritation of the bladder. So sometimes people have some diarrhea or have to urinate more often or more urgently as though they have a urinary infection. And we have medicines and other things that can help people get through it better. So open communication is key. Yeah, absolutely. Point. Now, one of the questions that we have been seeing that pops up, mm -hmm. there seems to be sometimes a little confusion between different kinds of cancer, like ovarian, mm -hmm. uh, cervical. Can you explain a little bit? Because I, I really want to make sure that people who are watching this Facebook Live can feel that all their questions have been answered. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, again, one of the great things about the, uh, the tumor board is, is that the patient comes in and, the, and we really focus on again, the, their specific diagnosis and what they're, all the information that we have in terms of the imaging and the and pathology, the location. the location. And so a lot of diseases such as ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer, the primary treatment is surgery. And then at the time of surgery, looking at the results and looking, understanding the pathology, sort of looking under the microscope and seeing what risk factors a patient may have, that then that dictates what we're gonna do next in terms of whether there's radiation involved, whether there's chemotherapy uh, or other types of systemic therapy, or potentially both. But there are different kinds of cancer, cervical, yes. endometrial, yes. and ovarian. Ex exactly. So, so even and though surgery might be the first step for right. all three, mm -hmm. treatments will vary depending on exactly. whether it's cervical or not. Correct, right. correct, yeah. And so cervical cancer um, is, a, is a cancer that's very commonly managed with radiation and chemotherapy and no surgery. And so I get that quite, we get that question sometimes saying, well, is it better if we do surgery? And for, for cervical cancer in specific, in specific case, it generally, it's not, it doesn't add anything. Okay. If, you're, if you're going to get radiation and chemotherapy up front, then usually you won't need surgery after. Whereas for some of these other types of gynecologic cancers, uh, for like you said, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, vulvar cancer, that often surgery is, is the first step. Okay. And then, and then after that, finding out what what's needed. No, that's very important, and thank you for clarifying. Now we're getting a question from our audience. I'm going to read it. Does the HPV vaccine interfere with any other vaccines? Is there any cause for concern? So, in terms of interfering, no. There, there's there's no concern that that the HPV vaccine would interfere with other vaccines that that you would get. In, in terms of certain medical conditions, say a very weak immune system, you know, that's, that's something that when you go in to talk about the, getting the vaccine, that's something your doctor or your provider is gonna ask you about uh, if you're one of those very small percentage of people. But for the most part, no concerns. So always discuss with a pediatrician before getting the vaccine for your kids. That would be the first tip. Exactly. And the second tip is for anybody who's not a kid anymore to also discuss it with their primary doctor, their OBGYN, mm -hmm. or any general practici practitioner. Exactly, exactly. But even at certain you know, walk-in clinics, for the most part, if, they, if you, you can walk in and say, hey, I would like to get the HPV vaccine, they'll ask you a number of questions, and then after that, the, you should be, the, be okay to get it. 
Okay, and I had received a question before I came here okay. regarding the HPV vaccine because many people have been exposed to HPV mm -hmm. already. So would the vaccine still be effective at preventing cervical cancer or if you have already been exposed then the vaccine would not be effective at all? So for the strains of the HPV virus you've been exposed to already, the vaccine's not effective against okay. those vaccines. What's nice, the HPV vaccine now uh, protects against nine different types of HPV, basically two that cause warts and seven that are the most common types that could cause a cervical cancer. And so even if you've been exposed to one or two strains, that then the vaccine will protect you against the other ones. That's great. So any other vaccines coming up that, on the pipeline that you're aware of that might help with cervical cancer? So in terms of you know, treatment, there, there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, treatments that are, that are coming on in, in, in terms of trying to reduce some of the, both trying to be better in terms of having more control of the tumor. And so one, one item that's being looked at is something like immunotherapy, uh, trying to activate your body's immune system to fight any residual cancer cells that you may have after your treatment. Um, and another is uh, for radiation specifically looking at different types of um, treatment machines that may be able to focus the radiation even better and help spare you know, normal tissue and make the treatment more, more tolerable. Okay, so for treatment wise that, that is mm -hmm. quite amazing. Yeah. Stephanie, is there anything that you would like to tell other women who might be considering how to take better care of their health or maybe they haven't even had their pap smear this this year oh they better go get it <laughs> they better get it because it's it's no joke from the point when you find when you find out mentally you need to be prepared like i was i hadn't seen a doctor in a long while that's my own fault why so hadn't I'm, you seen a doctor i was I, I put work before anything um i felt as if i had something to prove at work and not focus on myself so um I hadn't been to a doctor in forever, and when I was diagnosed um, at my gynecologist, I did not cry because I knew it was my fault. So my first, it's not you can your say, fault. you can it say, really isn't your fault. <laughs> you can say that I'm being too hard on myself, but it is my own fault, and that's why I took this like a champ because the first thing I took, I told Doctor Lambro. Um, which is my um, gynecological oncologist, these long names. Um, I told him, so let's get started. What do we need to do? I'm up for everything. And if you don't go with a mind like that, it's, it's going to bring you down. So I suggest to every single woman and male is that they go get themselves checked. Um, women, I can tell them through an easy pap smear, it doesn't take you too long. Um, to schedule or to even see your doctor, um, you don't have any symptoms. I had no symptoms, so you would never know um, unless there's other things that I did have that I barely realized because I was so used to it for all these years. Um, go get a pap smear. And I've, I've actually had some people reach out to me and say, you know what, Steph, since you came out, I went ahead and did a pap and I had pre-cervical cancer. So I said, good for you, because they were pre-cervical. You caught it on time. Mine was post, and look at what I had to go through. Women, please take care of yourselves. Don't be like me. Um, work is not 300% worth it. You're replaceable. So um, pay attention to your health. That's Plus, what I would say. If you're sick, you can't work, and right. you can't take care of others. You're replaceable. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very important. Yep. Thank, thank you for for that and for being so honest and upfront about your story. No problem. And it's very inspiring too. <laughs> Thank you. She has a sense of humor. I have to <laughs> tell you, it's amazing. So we have another question from the audience. When you rang the bell after your last treatment, what was going through your mind? I don't have to be here anymore. <laughs> 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 I, I was sad at the same time too um, if anybody saw that video yeah. I was very sad because of the people that I was surrounded by I had Miami Cancer Institute has something called a nurse navigator it's like a personal assistant mm -hmm. 
I never had a personal assistant. So it was, she was, and her name is Faith. Can you imagine <laughs> her name is Faith? So, and she would arrange all my appointments. Um, I, I don't know what I w would have done without her. Um, the, the different nurses at the Miami Cancer Institute, I was sad that day because I, I wasn't going to see them. But thank God for Dr. Kalman that every time I go to Miami Cancer Institute, we go and see everybody. It takes me like two, three hours. <laughs> when I go on an appointment, I'm like, yeah, this is going to take three hours. <laughs> so, um, but from my body, from a body perspective, um, mentally, I was super happy with the outcome. Even, even though I was su super tired afterwards, I was just relieved. And I was still nervous, don't get me wrong. After my first MRI, I had to wait another four months for my pet. Four weeks. Four, four weeks. Four but weeks they seemed like four months. Yes, yes. Long yes. Long so I was on an on a egg, like they say in my, in my country. Um, and I was hoping for the best. And I, sh I should have never doubted that. But um, it's, it's, it's common, right? It's human to, to feel that way. And once I found out, I, I'm sorry, I went drinking. <laughs> I, as soon as I found out, I called Dr. Kalman. He didn't pick up because he was busy. He called me afterwards. He left me a voice message saying, I know it's Friday, so I should let you know that you're completely clean. And I called him back and I said, can I go drinking, please? <laughs> like, I want to drink so bad to celebrate this. And it was the best news ever. I don't think there's anything else that would have such a great news that I would have ever been so happy with. And such a heavy weight that is yes. lifted off your shoulders. Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad that you got to celebrate. Yes. And, and Dr. Kalman, any tips, anything that you feel that everybody seeing and watching this Facebook Live should know, like regarding how to protect themselves? And if there were like one or two tips that you would give everybody. Yeah. I, I think that my number one number one thing would be to get vaccinated. Uh, I have three girls that, that right now are too young, but as soon as they turn 11, they will be getting the HPV vaccine. And, and I think that there's a lot of sometimes stigma uh, around you know, gynecological concerns or, and cancers. And I think that people should know that this is, you know, this happens. And, and that you should you know, seek help, talk to people about it. Uh, I think, Stephanie, when you first, you said you first posted on your Facebook after everything was done, how, how what a great response that, that people gave you. Yep. And, and I mean, our, and just for Stephanie in, in particular, I mean, our staff was so excited to see her every, every day. Yes, they were. Uh, <laughs> had such a great energy, such a great attitude. And, and when she finished, I mean, we, we were we were a little sad. That <laughs> we were, we're being we, but, honest, huh? Well, we were so ha we were so happy that that we were so we were going to see you the next day. But we were so happy that that you got through and you yeah. did so well. Um, it really and so it, it makes everyone's day when you when you come back and they, and they get to see you. Give me a job there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. This is all on camera. Maybe you'll end up being a nurse navigator. Uh, no. Yeah. No. No. No, no, we no, should, no. We should give a special. I think that's one thing that makes uh, Miami Cancer very special is the nurse navigation program. And, and Faith, I mean, uh, we, everyone loves her. And, and she is really a, a, the glue yeah. that, that helps make because there's a lot of different appointments. There's a lot of things that, that are going on. Yeah. And she's just someone who's there, who you who you get to know, and who you can call when you have a question or a concern. And so, I, I mean, it makes our job so much easier to to have. I mean, Faith in particular, but the, the navigators really do a wonderful job. Yep. I agree, and I will extend a special thank you to all the nurses and all the nurse navigators because you make a huge, huge difference, not only in the patients' lives but in the extended family as well. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing everything with us because okay. it's not easy to talk about something that. Oh, yes, it is difficult. once you're done with it. <laughs> 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 and thanks for also advising people to take care of their health. And Dr. Kalman, thank you so much for taking such good care of all the patients and for answering all our questions. My pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. 
and remember to follow us on social media. You can see all our handles on the screen. And remember that for any other concerns, maybe for your yearly checkup, check out Baptist Health South Florida. The doctors there are incredible and I trust them as well. So please, please make sure to get a pap smear, to get vaccinated, and to empower yourself with credible information to make the best choices and decisions for your family and for yourself. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you soon here on Facebook and on social media. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Until next time, bye.